Well, let me just again reiterate a word of welcome to you. Those of you perhaps just uh, logged on within the last couple of minutes, uh, maybe you didn't get the warm welcome that others of us enjoyed from Saida. So let me just again welcome each and every one of you who are logging on live here tonight with us at Grace Church. My name is Eric Bancroft. I have the privilege to pastor here at Grace Church. And I am really looking forward to being able to meet a number of you, perhaps for the first time. And that is what's coming up next week. Before I talk about that, what's coming up a week from today, let's talk about what's coming up a week from yesterday. And that is Saturday, August 8th. Uh, we are having our first work day as a church since being here at our new facility that we are renting from. Uh, as you know, if you are a member at Grace Church, wherever we are, we want to be a blessing, both in our larger community uh, as well as in our immediate vicinity as far as the property that we meet in. And that's been our practice for the last year and a half as a church, and it's going to continue to be our practice, we pray. And so uh, the church that so graciously hosts us is Miami Shores Baptist Church, and we want to be a blessing to them. So next Saturday, this coming Saturday, Saturday, August 8th, we're meeting here at 9 a.m. We're going to send out an email to you this week because we want to kind of get a little bit of an RSVP of how many of you we can expect. We've got different projects and placements depending on the size of the group we have. We have more projects that we have time or bodies to do in one day, um, but it'll be a start for us. And so I want to encourage you when you get that email uh, to make sure to RSVP to that. If you're not normally on our email list and you're interested in volunteering for even just for the morning time, uh, please let us know. Email us at info at gracechurch.miami. You can find it there on our webpage, gracechurch.miami. Uh, we'll put you on the, on the information list and get that email out to you. Also, our connect card below. But that's, that's next Saturday, August 8th. That's our service worship project work day. You'll get more details on that. We're going to kind of put people in different places around the property. So we'll still have social distancing. People be healthy and be working together. The second and big announcement, because we've been looking forward to this and had to reset it a time, and that is next Sunday, Lord willing, Sunday, August 9th. For those of you who are available and able to be able to join us in person, we are meeting here at Miami Shores Baptist Church. That address we've given you in the past, but just to remind you, 370 Grand Concourse here in Miami Shores. And uh, it's just right off the 95 highway, down exit 95, a few blocks. You'll find us here. Very easy to get to if you don't live in the immediate vicinity. We meet at 5 p.m., uh, we are asking you to wear masks, whether it's kind of the medical style mask or like the face mask that I typically wear. Uh, we are asking you to bring that with you and to have that. Uh, we will have social distancing, but we're going to sing together. We're going to read the word together. It's going to be great to be together. And again, as Saida said earlier, if you, if, you didn't, if you did miss that, for those of you who cannot be with us, we will be still online. So just know that you can be with us whether it's in person or online at 5 p.m. So that's big news. I just want to reiterate because it is such big news what's coming up on Saturday, what's coming up on Sunday. Well, I am looking forward to tonight uh, for what we have for us and just thinking about what's been going on in recent news. Uh, in fact, this afternoon, maybe some of you doing what I was doing. I was watching the live feed of the return of the um, SpaceX as these two gentlemen were coming back, the astronauts coming back from the International Space Station, watching them land in the Gulf, remarkable to see. Uh, as you think about just sort of good news in the, in the recent news, lots of things being aware of. One conversation that's come up recently is the topic of TikTok. Some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. Others of you are like, oh yeah, I know TikTok. I've got it on my phone. I enjoy it. I share videos with other people about it. Uh, TikTok, if you don't know, is a Chinese video sharing social networking service that's owned by a company called ByteDance. And uh, it's a company based in Beijing. It's an internet technology company that started in 2012. Well, there's been sort of concerns that some people have expressed or not expressed about TikTok. And I'm not here to comment on that, except to sort of give you some perspective. For example, back in February of 2020, Reddit co-founder and CEO Steve Huffman branded the app, quote, fundamentally parasitic. He says that, quote, he uses fingerprinting technology that is truly terrifying and labeling TikTok as spyware. Um, just yesterday, the director of the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy, Peter Navarro, said, 
quote, every time you sign up for TikTok, all your information is potentially going right back to the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese military, and the Chinese government. They can use these social media apps to steal your personal information, your business information. They use these social media apps to track you and surveil you and monitor your movements. Well, friends, whether that's actually happening or not, I cannot say. You'll notice even he says himself, potentially. The concern, of course, is that when you have companies in such countries, that such countries' governments might actually have access to those companies' databases, especially if they're in communist-controlled areas. But this is not a new conversation that started. In fact, it's made even recent news because of the President of the United States and what he said about whether or not he's going to ban TikTok. And I'm not here to pass any commentary on that. But this challenge of other countries and their companies associated with their countries and whether or not those are backdoors into different citizens' access of information is not new. Some of you remember the, the app called Face App. Uh, Face app was made popular by celebrities. Perhaps some of you uh, downloaded it, put it on your phone because you wanted to see what would you look like when you got older. If you're not familiar with this app, it's basically an app where you, once you uploaded a picture of yourself, it would then put over that picture kind of the appropriate appearance of what you looked like with gray hair, if you even had hair, gray beard, gray wrinkles, whatever it might have been that you would actually look like. And it was something that kind of took the world by storm, became very viral and how many people were using it. But the problem was that it was acknowledged that the app collected and accessed photos, location information, usage data, and browsing history. And while the app states that it won't rent or sell that information to third parties, it would share certain information with third-party advertising partners for targeted ads. Nothing new here. But the greater concern was that the app was owned by Wireless Lab, a Russian company, and people expressed concern that your information would be accessible by the Russian government. Again, whether or not that's true, I cannot say. I do not have that intelligence access to know if that's true, if that's the suspicion or fear of it being true. But we see, though, is that the concern in recent years about countries and access to other situations, that the new powers rising up of concern are not necessarily military-based as we think of them traditionally. It's not necessarily the concern about will a country have access to nuclear weapons, conversations still of concern regarding North Korea and its leadership, but rather technological warfare, where the secret weapon will be some type of computer coding that that embeds itself, that gathers information and then takes over at the appointed time to whatever wicked government or organization seeks it to do. Well, whether it is the catapult used in medieval warfare, or the atomic bomb used in World War II, or today's spyware used by lots of different people and potentially organizations and governments themselves, there's always this search, this hunt for the secret weapon. The weapon that's unknown to others, but only to those who have created it. And would seemingly give them an upper hand in defeating their opponent. Well, this is very similar for Christians today. You see, Christians today, perhaps surprising to some of you as Christians or others of you who are not Christians, do see themselves, based on the teachings of the Bible, as being engaged in a type of warfare. Now, it's a distinctly different warfare than we typically think of or see It's a warfare that the Scripture describes. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul writes, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The same author tells a different church in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, Though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So this imagery of warfare is coming to mind based on Scripture and this idea of what weapons we have as well. 
Well, if you were with us last week in Matthew chapter 6, you know one of those seemingly weapons that Jesus gives to us is that of prayer. Now, for those of you who are just joining us perhaps for the first time, let me just say again, welcome to the Gathering of Grace Church, at least as it is online, and hopefully next week you can join us in person if you feel comfortable and are able to do so. But we as a church have been working through one of the most infamous teachings in all of the Bible, that is the writings of Matthew. He was a follower of Jesus. He was an eyewitness in person with Jesus, and he wrote down a lot of what Jesus did and a lot of what Jesus said. And in Matthew chapter 6 is the sixth chapter in his 28-chapter collection of writings where he is capturing the teachings of Jesus. And this is in the middle of what's known as the greatest sermon ever preached in human history. It's the Sermon on the Mount, as it's referred to, because of where Jesus was in this kind of upper area of Judea, where he was preaching from. And Jesus is teaching significantly about prayer. And he just already, as we've looked at for the previous three weeks on Sundays, he talks differently about prayer than a lot of us naturally think about it. Whether it's a relationship with God as our Father, our Heavenly Father, whether it's understanding the significance of desiring God's glory above our own, or as we saw last week, even thinking about what does it mean to really understand our needs. Well, in the middle of that, as we saw last week in verse 12, or excuse me, in verse 13, he talks about leading us not into temptation, but delivering us from evil. It was in that that we saw this weapon to be used in fighting against temptation is that of prayer. But we also learned tonight of a secret weapon. It's a secret because, number one, a lot of Christians do not know about it, or number two, because of reasons that we're about to learn, A lot of Christians don't necessarily talk about it for the right reasons. And to learn this weapon, you'll see this with me. So look with me at Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 and 18, and follow along as I read the passage to us. Jesus says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward, But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, what Jesus is talking about here is really the issue of privacy policy. Privacy policy. You understand this. If you download an app, you get an upgrade on your Android phone or your, or your Apple phone, you understand that you inevitably have to go through a, a privacy policy. You have to read it. And if we can be honest, most of us do not read it. We just scroll to the very bottom, click yes, and then accept it and we move on. And we're not quite sure exactly what we agreed to. We just kind of pragmatically recognize we just want to have access to whatever the software is or this technology device is. And so a lot of times companies have to disclose legally what is their privacy policy. Well, Jesus is talking about a heavenly privacy policy here. He's talking about an interest in recognizing the significance of how Christians should recognize how they're to do their acts of righteousness. In fact, let me just remind you, go back to chapter 6, verse 1, the whole scene he's talking about. Verse 1, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. The main issue that Jesus is repeatedly addressing here of verses 16 and 18 is pointing back to, is this practice of this privacy policy of Christianity. Is what you do, is what I do, to be seen by other people or to be seen by God? To be blessed and affirmed by other people or to be recognized and rewarded by my Heavenly Father? The privacy policy of heaven, God is basically saying, similar to the words of Moses, similar to the words of Joshua, as rippled throughout the Old and New Testament, choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day for what reasons you are serving. Is it for man or is it for God? It comes to this topic of fasting. Now, this topic of fasting in verse 16, he says it just very matter-of-factly as if everybody understood it. Well, that's true then. I trust it's not true for necessarily everybody today. 
Some of you understand fasting. We'll get to that in a second. Others of you are like, what are we even talking about here? So let me just make sure we're sort of on the same page because in verse 16, he says, when you fast. It's no introduction of explanation. It's just one of assumption. But let me not make that assumption on you, the listener today. Because you see in verse 16, the subject of a fasting is assumed. The term fast literally means abstain from. It's typically meant to abstain from food or drink. It's like the word lust. When we think of the word lust, it's often applied to the topic of sexual desire. But lust can be applied generically to all kinds of categories. It's this insatiable, relentless appetite for something that I have to have. I'm consumed by it. I'm driven by it. And so, in that sense, fasting, very similarly, principally, fasting can be localized to just the topic of food, which is largely the context here, but we're going to broaden it by application in a few minutes. Or it can be largely understood in a general category of just what you abstain from. So, Jesus is talking about specifically this idea in their context of abstaining from food, withdrawing from what would be normal practice of consuming Now, some of you are already fasting. This is a practice you grew up on. You fasted from vegetables. Uh, Some of you are fasting today from kale. I try to fast from kale as much as possible. That's my wife puts it in front of me. Some of you are fasting from soda. Some of you are fasting from coffee. Some of you are just choosing voluntarily, regularly, and repeatedly to just stay away from certain things. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about this regular practice of consumption that then is occasionally withheld from. And this was a practice of theirs, which we'll speak about here in the context. So the idea of here of fasting is done for religious purposes. Religious purposes. In fact, today, some of you probably think of fasting because of it being kind of more in vogue, more popular in fitness circles. You know, Miami here, we have a lot of attention put on beauty and vanity and imagery and body fat percentages and how you look and so much narcissism with our social media posts and the angles and the lighting and fasting can help with that and can help with the acceleration of weight reduction. And so some people fast quite regularly for their own health purposes. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not what they're dealing with at that time. Fasting was for religious purposes. And that's what he's trying to address. Now, religious purposes need to be clearly understood as to the Christian way of practicing it versus generic religious ways. Because the truth is, the practice in the world today is common in every kind of religious group of fasting. Cults practice fasting, but it's often done in a way to punish oneself, uh, to to attract the attention of a deity that they worship, to, to gain that God's favor, to demonstrate their commitment to any particular God. But that's different than what Jesus is addressing here. Jesus is not talking about fasting to gain God's attention or God's favor. It's not what he's talking about. This isn't another way to gain your salvation through works. That's not what he was teaching earlier about giving in the previous verses of verses 2 through 4. So now what he's talking about in the conversation of prayer, as he's talking about here in verses 5 through 15. And not what he's talking about here in verses 16 and 18. It needs to be very clear to everybody, even present here today, that the way that we have access to God is not first and foremost based on what we do. If you were with us a few minutes earlier, you heard Garrett say this as he described his own testimony, his own story of God's grace in his life. That the way that we have peace with God is not by checking enough religious boxes watch enough services, listen to enough scripture, attend enough service projects at a church or a local food charity, abstain from some bad things, maybe a little less nicotine in your life, maybe a little less alcohol in your life, maybe a little little less sex in your life. No, that's not how we gain favor with God. It's not by our good works. It is only through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone because of His His grace alone. It is only when we recognize that we are a sinner who have no right relationship with God 
that sin has separated us from God, that we need to put our faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of our sins. That he, the righteous son of God, obeyed in every way like we have not. And then was crucified in our place that all those who would believe in him alone would be forgiven. And resurrecting from the grave three days later that all those who believe in him would also resurrect in the future to come. Your friends, to be clear, Jesus is addressing something very important here. He's correcting a problem that I also want to correct with anybody listening today. And that is this idea of having a religion relationship versus actually a regular relationship with God. See, too often people are concerned about having a religious relationship in order to be seen by other people. Jesus says that's not how followers of Christ live. They do things for completely different reasons. It is an outworking of, a demonstration of the relationship with God. Not to earn that relationship, but to demonstrate the security of that relationship that already exists through faith in Christ alone. And that's what he's talking about here, this topic of fasting. This idea of fasting is this idea of hunger for homesickness for God. I'm, I've been helped in the reading um, of a book titled, A Hunger for God, Desiring God Through Fasting and Prayer. The author is John Piper. Uh, if you've not read this book and you're interested to learn more about this afterwards, that's a book I recommend. A Hunger for God is the title of it. Uh, you can find it at a, at a good solid uh, bookstore online. Well, we might be able to find that for you. But in this book, he is talking about the distinction about this idea of hungering for God. He says half of Christian fasting is that our physical appetite is lost because of a homesickness for God. And the other half is that our homesickness for God is being threatened by our physical appetite. So intense. Saying it differently, the appetite is lost for the things of this world while the appetite is growing for the things of God. This idea of homesickness We'll see more here in a few minutes. Putting ourselves back in the context of the scriptures, Jesus, you notice in verse 16, says, and when you fast. Very similar to what he says earlier in verse 2. When you give, verse 5, when you pray. Again, verse 7, when you pray. And again here, verse 16, when you fast. Putting ourselves back in the context of the Jewish audience that he was speaking to and the practices even represented throughout the Old Testament, there was actually only one time where fasting was commanded in the Bible. It's back in Leviticus at the Day of Atonement. Since then, we were seeing different times where the people of Israel fasted. For example, they fasted during times of sorrow. For example, King David fasted. He withheld himself from eating as he was mourning the sickness of his son, as Bathsheba got sick and the son was potentially going to die and he later did die. We also see there's times of fasting that people have done when danger was coming. In 2 Chronicles 20 verse 3, King Jehoshaphat ordered a fast when Judah was threatening by the coming Moabites who were going to be attacked physically. There's also been times of important tasks or work of ministry that there's been fasting recorded. Moses fasted for 40 days. Jesus fasted for 40 days. In Acts chapter 13, the leaders in the church are going to be sending out Paul and Barnabas, and so they fast. Later on, after new churches are planted, they later are given a plurality of elders who are appointed, and they, says, it says that they pray and they fast and lay hands on these men. So we see that fasting was a practice in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. The question is this. Is fasting commanded for us today? The answer is no. Should fasting be practiced today? The answer is yes. And right now you're thinking, I'm really confused. Is it no or is it yes? I'm, is it, I'm, where we, well, keeping your finger in Matthew 6, go with me to Matthew 9. I want you to look at what Jesus says about fasting in Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to read to you just two of these verses here. Matthew 9, a text we'll get to in more detail in the coming weeks, but let me just give you a sneak peek here. Verse 14, then the disciples of John, these are uh, followers of John the Baptist, the disciples of John came to him, being Jesus, 
and saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. And he goes on to give more explanation that we'll look at in the coming weeks. Jesus is referring to himself, meaning, hey, I am present with the disciples now. There's no need for them to be fasting. But the time will come in my absence that they will fast. It's more of this indicative than it is this imperative, more the statement of fact than it is this command. In fact, carefully, Paul, later on in Colossians 2, talks about people who think they are more religious because of their fast. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. And Paul's like, that's wrong. That's wrong. So what we're seeing here is this sort of careful explanation. We're going back to Matthew 6. Look at how Jesus says. He says, when you fast. And then he kind of gives this breakdown. This breakdown is because Jesus is not concerned about the mode or the timing of the fasting. He's concerned with the motive. For Jesus, it always gets to this basic question. Why do you do what you do? And that's a great question to just ask yourself at any given time, on any given topic, and for any given reason. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I saying what I'm saying? Why am I wearing what I'm wearing? Why am I posting what I'm posting? Why am I thinking what I'm thinking? Get to the question of why. This is a good accountability question that Jesus is driving at here in Matthew 6. Why are you giving your money? Why are you praying the way that you're praying? Why are you fasting when and how you're fasting? The issue, what was the issue with the Pharisees? Well, look at what he's describing here in verse 16. Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. It's a common problem, right? Common problem. You go back to verse 1, this whole idea of in order to be seen by them. Again, this common problem here in verse 2, this idea of giving to the needy, this idea that they do so to be praised by others. Again, you see this as well in verse 5 of praying. He talks about praying that they may see be seen by others. He says this is a common problem. Well, Jesus is talking about this problem particularly for the Pharisees. Why? Well, because the Pharisees had this practice where they would fast Two days a week. You're like, why two days? Well, it was a tradition for the religious elite, the sort of religious leaders at that time, the particular group of the Pharisees. There were different religious groups of leaders, but particularly talking about the Pharisees. The Pharisees would fast on Thursday and on Monday. You're like, why Thursday and why Monday? Because Thursday was the day that was believed that Moses went up to Mount Sinai to be with God personally before when he got the Ten Commandments. And then later on, on Monday, when he descended. And so they would, sort of in honor of that, they would seemingly fast on that Thursday and then on that Monday. It also, ironically, happened to be the two busiest days in the market in town. When the most amount of business was taking place in the market. Well, how convenient if you're trying to go public with your self-righteousness. And that's exactly what they were doing says here that they disfigured their faces. Now, this idea of disfiguring their faces, I don't think means that they made like weird sort of faces as if they're just trying to like, you know, distortion. But rather this idea of somebody who looks like they are exhausted. Right? I mean, it's kind of like somebody like if you, if you go to someone's house, knock on their door, their apartment, knock on their door, and they come to the door, you can tell if they just woke up from bed, right? Like you can tell like, oh, the hair is kind of getting kind of crazy or the face looks like got some wrinkles like, hey, you need a minute? Like you look like you're just fresh out of bed. Not a problem, but sometimes we can catch people like that or out of a nap or something or maybe just not even got a lot of sleep or whatever. Well, these are situations where people would actually try to give this representation of just how overwhelmed they were. Just, you know, just out here for God. Just out here denying myself. And similar to their prayer times where they'd put themselves on busy corners praying that they might be seen by others so they would themselves appear to be just exhausted, just worn out. 
And honestly, they would appear to be undeniably like super spiritual to the rest of us. Like, man, you're just, you love God. I mean, I kind of feel guilty around you. You're like super spiritual. I mean, I, I can't think of the last time I fasted. I mean, you like seriously must really love the law. You must really love, you know, following the teachings of Moses. Man, you're, you're committed. <sighs> yeah, I love the Lord. And they probably had the same kind of, you know, cheesy phrases that we sometimes bust out today when we talk to people like this. And Jesus is saying, this is the problem. Their motive was to be noticed by men, and they changed their appearance. But look at what Jesus says is the right practice. If that's the wrong practice in verse 16, what's the right practice? Verse 17, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Why? Verse 18, that your fasting may not be seen by others. You see, the idea here is, is this idea that people should not know that you are in an intense season of trusting in the Lord, desiring Him, where you kind of go public with this all the time. Now, just to be clear, in case you think like this is like word for we should be doing today, anointing your head. Some of your translations might even say anointing your head with oil. Like, oh, should I be getting like some vegetable oil out, pouring it on my head? What does this look like? What does it do? This was, a, this was like their idea of um, the different types of oil that could be used. This idea of cleaning themselves up and probably like putting a good fragrance on. This idea like, you know, somebody's like not taking a shower in days, like you're not left wondering because we all know we can smell them. Like, whew, you might want to, you know, hit the shower, just grab a bag of wipes or something. Versus people who are like, man, they freshly shaved, they're showered, their hair looks decent, if they have hair. They are, you know, they, they smell good, they got some deodorant on, like they, they seem like they're presentable. They're not looking ragged, they're not res- presenting themselves being exhausted for Jesus. Jesus says that's how we're to act. Jesus says, are you okay with knowing that people don't know about you what God knows about you? Which is your commitment to Him is in such an area that they'll never even see. You see, fasting is very similar to praying in that the motive of it and often the practice of it is largely done outside of people, but where fasting gets a little tricky is unlike praying, which you can pray when you're with people just in your head, you're praying, you're not necessarily saying, you're like, oh, give me a second, I need to... I need to say a few more words to God. I'm really having some good intimacy here. Like, oh, okay, sorry about that. So can fasting be a little tricky? You're like, hey, you want to grab a bite? You're like, well, I'd love to, but I'm fasting today. So I'm going to use this time instead to read my Bible. Like, whoa, okay, mic dropper. Uh, Just kind of having a spiritual moment there. Sorry to interrupt your little spiritual retreat. Where fasting gets tricky is because you have to decide how you're going to engage with people during this time. Now, to be clear, the motive of fasting is to withdraw from something in order to gain something else. In other words, what you regularly desire, what you regularly participate in, what you regularly consume, you now withhold in order to take that appetite, that desire, and spend that effort, that energy, that time in relationship with the Lord. Do you notice how interesting this is? Go back to Matthew 6, verse 11. What did Jesus get finished teaching us about? Give us this day our daily bread. And now he's talking about fasting. So Jesus is actually teaching us here that there's actually something more sustainable more surprisingly life-giving than even the most basic of material needs. In fact, we got a taste of that earlier in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, not for daily bread, but for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You see, Jesus is talking about an appetite for something greater than any other object or desire in your life. Even seemingly basic things. And that's where I think it gets 
uncomfortable at best, if not convicting at worst. Because you have to begin to ask yourself the same questions that I've been asking myself, which is, what is it that I think is from God, daily bread, but that I have wrongly wanted more than God? With a gift has become my God. That I cannot imagine my day without it. For some of you, it's not a meal. For some of you, it's a drink. I can't imagine my day without a cup of coffee. I can't imagine my day without my fix of caffeine. For some of you, it's a TV show. I, I, I've got to make sure I catch the next episode of this show that I've been watching regularly. I can't imagine missing the sale that I've been waiting for. I can't imagine missing this relationship that I've been wanting. What is it that's in your life that if you were to withhold yourself from it, even but for a short time, it would create in you a hole, a longing, a desire, an uncomfortability, maybe even a headache? That God is tapping you on the shoulder with that and saying, that's where I want you to direct that attention towards me. Spend longer with me in the Word. Read and think. Listen to me speak to you from my Word here. Or spend longer with God in prayer where God is wanting to hear from you as you now have heard from Him. Where you are listening to good Christian songs to help edify your soul that helps you to think of truth and to marinate on that where your soul is being dipped in the sweet, tender marinade of God's Word where it has that flavor to it. It comes out in your speech comes out in your perspective and your thinking. Friends, fasting is a gift from God. Not to reduce our body fat. Not to redirect our caloric intake from carbs to proteins to fats. Fasting is a way to say, God, I do not want anything, anything to have mastery over me. That if I have you, I am satisfied. And to do that, where people don't even know that's what you're doing. Whereas it says here in verse 18, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And consistent with what he said in the previous verses, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The irony here is that these last 18 verses is that it's not these other issues that are being addressed. It's this issue about how hypocrites ultimately have themselves in view. What God is doing is just politely turning our attention from others to ourselves to Him. Do you realize that even when in these motives here to be thought of well by others, It's just a perverse form of self-thought. It really has myself at the center of it. I want to be thought of well by others in order that others' good thoughts about me can affirm what I think about me or what I want to think about me. It highlights a fundamental problem. We do similar things today. We can recognize this. Just take, for example, a basic conversation. You learn someone has traveled. You learn someone has done a particular job. You learn someone has had as a particular skill. Let me ask you a question. How quick are you to hear them out, to ask them more about that, to learn more about them and from them? Or are you in order that they might think well of by you, quick to interrupt them to tell them about what you have done, what you have seen, what you have read, what you have learned, what you know, where where you have gone. It's amazing to me how even in our conversational instincts, we can show either insecurity, 
I find my identity in what you think of me, and I, I don't know what you're going to think of me until I give you lots of information so that you might didn't think well of me. Or, in our pride, I think really well of me. I want to make sure you think well of me as well. That happens just in simple conversation. But something like fasting, something like prayer, is a chance where I can say, I can refrain from and be okay. That I'm not worried about what other people will think about me. That I'm not caught up in their praise of me and their affirmation of me and their attaboys about me. That it's okay if they think of me as being ignorant. It's okay if they think of me as being uneducated. They don't think of me about being untraveled, as inexperienced, as unattractive, as incompetent. I'm not here to try to build my PR campaign about my life accomplishments, my personality skill sets, or even my religious zeal for God. I'm okay not being known by men because I know I am known by my heavenly Father. You see, that's the challenge here in this text. Verses 1 to 18. Are you and I okay with only being known by our heavenly Father? I know that you know the right answer to that, but would that answer actually match your action? Where it does not, bring that to the Lord. Bring that to the Lord in prayer. Say, God, forgive me for finding the praise of men more satisfying than the affirmation and love and security from you. So where would we begin? Seeing that fasting is biblical, seeing that it can still be for us for today and longing for Jesus' return, where would we begin? Well, because God is our audience, not our man. Here are some things to think about, some ideas that we're to start. And these are just ideas. These are not, thus saith the Lord, just possible ways to begin to apply this. How about this? Refrain from your, quote unquote, must have drink. That drink that you just can't imagine not having. And, and, and feel, feel that effect. For some of you, I'm not going to lie, it's going to be a headache. It's going to be a headache. You know, you know yourself. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a particular carbonated drink. Uh, it's a particular caffeine drink, whatever it is. You, when you don't have it, you feel it. Take that feeling and convert it into a prayer conversation with God and say, God, what I feel right now for not having this drink... I want you, God, to give me that feeling when I don't have time with you. Because my concern is I can go days without conversation with you and I don't feel it. But I can just miss something like a drink and I miss that. That physical trigger, God, I want to use that as a spiritual trigger. I want to long for you like that. Refrain from your breakfast. It's just the opening meal of the day. Start with longing for more than food. When you feel that stomach, when you feel that desire, say, take that desire and say, I want something more than a bagel right now. Something more than a bowl of cereal right now. Something more than a muffin, a granola bar, whatever your routine is, a banana, whatever it is. I want something more than that. Refrain from your lunch. Be reminded of what truly sustains you. Maybe it's not your breakfast, maybe it's your lunch. It's just, it's just saying, today during my lunch break at work or today in my lunch break at home, I am going to take this time, instead of opening a lunch carryout, I'm going to open the Word and I'm going to feast because I want to hunger and thirst for righteousness and be satisfied by God. How about refraining from a, a must-have purchase? You know, things that you just love. There's things I love. There's things I think about, things I want to save my money for. And I'm not saying material possessions are bad in any way. They're gifts from God. But gifts often become gods. We have them, we'll be satisfied. Delay a purchase. Deny a purchase. Give away purchases. Replace any of these desires with spiritual food. Scripture reading, devotions, spiritual songs. 
This is the idea here. The idea is that nothing has mastery over you. Food, drink, possessions, accomplishments, or people's view of you. Doesn't matter. You're fine. Does this describe you? Where is God calling you to begin this week? What's a small step? What's a small step? To enjoy this intimacy with God. Here's what I want you to understand. God is not some heavenly police officer snooping around trying to catch you. He is omnipresent, always seeing you. Why? So that he might bless you. Do you see that? Your father who sees in secret will reward you. Do you see the relationship of the heavenly father there? When he introduces this idea of father, which we've spoken about before, it first comes up in chapter 5, but then it starts increasing in intensity at the end of 5 into chapter 6. And in chapter 6, it just comes front and center. Your father, your father, your father. It's not a father who desires to spank you, Though Hebrews 12 says the Lord does discipline those whom he loves, it's your Father who desires to reward you. God is a God of blessing. Show a favor to his children. Friend, if your faith is in Christ, that's the relationship you have with God. It's not one who's trying to catch you to punish you. Romans 8 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It's a relationship to be blessed to be loved, to be rewarded. That is how we have a relationship with our Father. So the question is, which spectator means more to you? Earthly or heavenly? Man or God? Whose praise and whose reward do you ultimately want? It's at this point, we're going to transition to a time of prayer. If you're joining us for the first time tonight, it's our normal practice every other Sunday to rotate between Q&A time about anything in the message or going on in the world, or prayer time. You know, this week is prayer time, and so I've asked some people to pray for us on behalf of us, which we're going to bring that up for you now, and then I will come back to you as well and pray for any particular requests that have been submitted either online or just in the comment section. After that time of prayer, we will then land it tonight, and I'll say a few words before we end it tonight of announcements just to remind you But let's now go before the Lord in prayer as we think about the things that are being said. As these people pray, they're praying on our behalf to our Heavenly Father.